I hope you are joining us with the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation. I'm here to welcome you and give a little bit of chatter time so that we can um, introduce folks to the Zoom platform and get them put on the screen or, or get them onto our platform. So um, hopefully everyone is logging in right now and thank you all for logging in. Uh, I'm going to cover just a little bit of information, uh, kind of a repeat from last night. If you guys were not able to join us last night, uh, we missed a, a great amount of information. But don't worry, we will have that on our website uh, as soon as we can kind of get through all of that technical information. And we will also have it on our YouTube channel. And if you will just Google Spastic Paraplegia Foundation, then you should be able to get to our YouTube channel. And we'll tell you more about all that kind of stuff as we go on. And if there's any questions about any of that, then I certainly want you to reach out and talk with us about those things. One of the things that uh, I'd like to kind of tell you and, and remind you is that if you have a question for the doctors, if you have a question uh, that is relevant to your uh, particular illness uh, condition, then please go down into the question and answers that's at the bottom of the screen. You'll see a thing that says Q&A. Those are the questions that we're actually going to be collecting uh, in order to have some future Zooms with the doctors and allow them time to answer those. So uh, we don't anticipate that there will be any questions today that will be answered by Dr. Fink. There may be, uh, you know, he's his own man and he will decide if he's got time uh, to give us at the end for questions. Uh, but we're really likely going to be holding those questions for a future Zoom. Also, if you've got technical problems uh, with your uh, technology, which you know we all do, right? Um, so no judgment in any way, but uh, there is the chat box that you can also kind of chat out or throw out an accolade uh, every now and then to somebody. But uh, be reminded that if you do have technical problems, it might be to your advantage to leave the meeting, go back into the original email that was sent to you from the Zoom service, and just reload yourself uh, back on to the, the platform. Uh, there are those that seem to have problems with that last night, uh, but today they're already saying that everything's working well. So whatever works, just, you know, we, we really can't do anything from our side to help you get on because as it turns out, this particular Zoom we have set up so that your face is not being seen by anyone and neither is your voice. So the only thing that you can do is actually uh, be able to uh, chat something there for us, uh, but the only thing that you can actually do is just go in and out. So I wanted to tell you that I am Norma Pruitt. I am the Spastic Conference Coordinator when it's been in person and now uh, on Zoom. And so I've got a team of folks with our committee that works to bring all of this information to you. So we are still adding more people to the, uh, uh, the platform right now that are joining us. And so what I wanna do is to be able to give uh, those folks time to get on. So I'm just kind of welcoming, giving a little bit of some chit chat. And I will share with you here in just a moment, a little bit on our Zoom uh, platform. I'm gonna share a screen. But just be reminded that all of this information will be shared on our YouTube channel and on our website. Now, if you will just bear with me for a second, making sure that technology is going to work properly, I'm going to share with you my screen and then I can talk to you about um, what we're going to do with the PowerPoint that I've got and that will give you a little bit of some information. I don't know why all this other stuff is popping up. So forgive me for a second. Let me clean up a little housekeeping here and go from the beginning on this PowerPoint presentation. Oop, oop. Okay, so here we are here. Uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, the Zoom questions. We've also got a Zoom store, uh, a, a SPF store. We've also got the Awareness Week. And again, all this information can be heard from the um, uh, meeting that we had last night. But we have here, if you will, we have got the um, store and these shirts are available uh, directly from the company that we are partnering with, but you can go through our website to get to that. Uh, once all of these have been uh, purchased, you will see that there's so many dates 
like right now the date says I think June 30th so once uh, June 30th has ended there will be a new campaign uh, that will start from July 1 to July 30th and then again August 1 to August 30th or until the August Awareness Week but what we did is that because uh, you are ordering what product you want then this is the way we had to set this up with our online partner. So as soon as all of those are purchased by this first date of June 30th, then they will be printed and then they will be shipped directly to you. So um, again, then July 1, there'll be a new campaign. And when that ends on July 30th, we'll open it up again. So if there are any questions about any of that, you guys can feel free to email us and we'll do what we can to answer uh, issues concerning that. Then we're going to be looking at come um, our uh, August Awareness Week. Each of these days, there's a particular challenge that we really want you to reach out on social media. And we want you to hashtag HSP and PLS so that you can be found and our information can help share an awareness of these two rare diseases. Uh, every day during this particular week, we will do about a 30 minute virtual visit so for any of you that are interested in wanting to um, come online and show us your face and show us your challenge for the day, I know that Jim Sheehan's working on a virtual 5K and there may be other actual 5Ks that people might be doing. And so that day on Sunday is going to be the day to share what you've done on your 5K or to show us a photo of you wearing your t-shirt on that day or whatever other day that we might be doing uh, any of these other activities. So I wanted to share that with you and you'll hear more about that as we go on and you can find all this information on our social media pages as well. So then uh, what we're going to do is I am about to finish up here with my uh, chatter. There again is a lot of folks that um, are still trying to log on and I'm getting communications uh, that some people are having problems. So again, if you're getting communications from people that are having problems, then what I'd like for you to do is to tell them just to try to log out, go back into the original uh, email that was sent to them and then just try to log back in again. So now I'm going to kind of stop sharing with you what I've got here and I'm going to introduce for you guys uh, the president of the foundation, uh, Frank Davis, he is going to bring some information to you. Uh, he's been with the foundation since 2005, and he has been the current elected president of the board of directors since 2012. So, um, well, not sure what happened to the light there, um, but you know, that's technology, right? So here's Frank. Thank you so much, Frank, for joining us. And if anybody has any questions, remember the Q and A box at the bottom, type those in. And if you've got a chat issue, then please feel free to chat it out to us and we'll do what we can to answer you. So thank you so much, Frank. And here you go. Hello, everyone. And welcome to the 2020 second day of our uh, annual conference, which for this year, for the first time, is a virtual conference. I said last night that I hope everybody would, uh, would uh, be patient with us if there were some rough edges, but there weren't too many last night, except we're local people's uh, technology. As many of you know, we, we, this is our first virtual conference and there are, uh, and I went over the advantages, but one of the disadvantages of a virtual conference is, is that I don't know which ones of you were here last night or how many of you were here last night. And so I feel like the, it's a lot of the information I was saying last night is important. So I'm going to repeat some of it and uh, forgive me to all, uh, please forgive me all the people that are going to hear this twice. But also an, an, a, something that's important is that I can't thank enough those people that need to be thanked. And um, so I'm going to thank them again and again, probably. And this, to start off with, the main uh, supporters for this conference are um, Chris Burkini with Burkini Farms, along with News Corporation that owns lots of uh, new, uh, television news stations and newspapers and the Hanger Foundation, which has been supporting causes like ours clear back to the mid 1800s, which gives them some experience. And we all owe them all a great deal of gratitude because this conference couldn't take place without them. For the last many years, I've been the person that gets things started with an initial talk. And this year I'm doing two initial talks, or if not more, because um, it's a virtual conference and we're trying to get things right. And, uh, 
I don't have any medical training, so my position and my my purpose is to thank people, introduce them, and to promote our, our uh, foundation as much as I can. When we first decided this year that we weren't going to be able to have a uh, in lot in person conference that was scheduled to be in Nashville, Tennessee, we were kind of feeling sorry for ourselves. Um, we weren't going to be able to meet so many of you that are very important to meet because, and we deal with you all the time. So we we're going to greatly miss the opportunity to shake your hands. I want to start my introductions today by, and thank yous, by congratulating our annual conference coordinator this year, who you just saw, Norma Pruitt, and her husband, Greg, who have done an outstanding job of organizing and coordinating this uh, virtual conference. They had to do a lot of uh, research to, to find out what was the best software to use for a virtual conference, and that's why we're using the Zoom software today. I want to offer a very special thanks to both of them. Our foundation is getting a lot of things done, working toward our cures. The scientists that keep working diligently on these diseases are supported through your donations and with the advice of our scientific advisory board that volunteer all their time. They are marching forward amazingly fast toward our, our goal. And what is that goal? To have everyone with HSP or PLS be quickly diagnosed, treated, and cured. Many of the top scientists will be speaking to you over the next several weeks. They are the, some of the most brilliant minds in the world concerning our rare diseases, and they will tell you about the hope of science working toward our cures. Our all volunteer board of directors and our state ambassadors have an unforgettable re resolve trying to manage the work of our foundation toward our cures. But none of this, not a single thing could be possible without the other people. Those people are you, the people that support our foundation year after year, make what we do possible. The Spastic Paraplegia Foundation was founded in February of 2002. Of the 18,346 different names and addresses in our database, 1,616 different people donated to our cause in 2019. They made 3,750 different donations, totaling a little over $890,000. <clears throat> Our donations have been growing healthfully over the last few years, and I want to sincerely thank you guys for making all of this possible. As you know, our primary mission is to fund research to cure HSP and PLS, and it is only through your donations that we are able to complete this mission. Thank you very much. Scientists estimate that there are about 25,000 people with HSP and about 1,000 people with PLS in the United States. I want to make, a folk, the, make the focus of my talk today to be an encouragement for more people with HSP to enter their contact information into our database and to find out and let us know what gene you have. You or members of your family can enter your contact information on our website. It only takes a few moments. We will never share anyone's contact information with any company or indi any individual without your written permission. We only ask for donations about once a year, so um, that can't be a reason to stay away. We only have the contact information for about 12% of the people with HSP in the United States. And we have contact information for about 93% of the people with PLS in the United States. Why the difference? I have a theory that the difference is the per in the participant rate, participation rate has to do with the fact that HSP is genetic and other patient advocacy groups of genetic diseases report the same problem. HSP has been in many families for several generations. In my over 15 years of experience volunteering for this foundation, I have found that often there is one member of a large HSP family an extended family that the family seems to appoint to be responsible for keeping up with HSP developments, both scientific and whatever, and with our foundation. 
that family member is supposed to let other family members with HSP know if any developments occur. A lot of HSP families just think of, the, of HSP as their family disease and they have learned to just accept and live with it, thinking that there's not much anybody can do about it and um, not much will anything will get done. Well, let me tell you, if you're a member of one of those kinds of HSP families, those were the old days. A lot has changed. With current science and genetic research, the HSP world is changing like the entertainment world changed when the television was invented and it replaced the radio. That change means that our HSP families need to similarly change our mindsets. New genetic science companies are popping up monthly, not yearly, but monthly all over the world. Scientists are coming to us and they wanna know how many people with this gene we can contact or how many people of that gene that we can contact. They do not wanna to try to cure a disease if there are not enough people in that gene to really make it worth their expense or effort because it takes a certain amount of people to get through the clinical trial process. That is why it is so important that we have your information and other people in your family's information. We need to know also, if at all possible, what gene you have. It wasn't long ago that getting an HSP genetic test was very expensive. When I got my test over 15 years ago, it cost me $10,000. A few years after that, the price climbed to $29,000 to get an HSP genetic test. Well, in the past, the last many years, that price continues to decline dramatically. The last time I checked, it cost $1,200 to get a full HSP genetic test, and I think it has come down a lot since then. You can find contact information for genetic testing companies on our website. One way to make it even more um, affordable that some HSP families have discovered is that if a lot of people in the same family will pitch in together, <clears throat> they can have one member of the family go get a, a genetic test. And then once the, uh, that gene has been determined, then the rest of the members who may not have shown um, symptoms yet or want to get some kind of confirmation can get their genetic test done for that one gene for about $100 each which I'm sure you agree is a lot more affordable. Additionally, almost all of the companies on our website have programs that if you tell them you can't afford uh, the $1,200, they will do it for a lower cost or free, but you have to be able to prove uh, that you can't afford it, which is a little more trouble. For those of you that know your gene, I think you will agree that there is some relief that you are making progress toward getting closer to the day when you can be cured. The most common HSP gene is SPG4 or spastin. About 40% of people with HSP have SPG4. So 40%, that means 10,000 people in the United States are supposed to have SPG4 HSP. And we have 243 of them in our database. The second most common HSP gene is SPG7 or paraplegian. About 17% of people with HSP have SPG7. Of the probably 4,250 people in the United States that should have SPG7 HSP, we have 103 of them in our database. The third most common HSP gene is SPG11 or spastic syndrome. About 8% of people with, S with HSP have SPG11. Of the about 2,000 people with SPG11 HSP in the United States, we have 54 of them in our database. Don't worry, I'm not gonna keep going through 80. Um, I just wanna stress to you how important it is that we get more information because we're hindered as the functionality of our foundation is hindered because we don't have more information about you and your family. <clears throat> Well, I, a lot has happened in the 18 years <clears throat> since the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation was founded in February of 2002. It was Mark Weber and Kathy Geisler, who with the help of Dr. John Fink at the University of Michigan and many other volunteers who had the vision of what we have before us today. I think they knew about four genes when we got started. <clears throat> since that time, over 80 genes 
have been discovered that when mutated can cause HSP. As I mentioned before, the sunlight of new hope is right there on the horizon. Thousands of scientific research articles have been published on HSP and PLS. You can think of those articles as stepping stones toward the final cure. The Spastic Paraplegia Foundation has funded over $9 million of the research on HSP and PLS. Additionally, our, our foundation has state ambassadors in almost every state of the United States. I think we're missing three states, Alaska being one of them, these state ambassadors will have get togethers a few times per year, inviting people with HSP and PLS along with their families. <clears throat> to get to uh, attend. At those get togethers, you'll be able to talk with and ask questions of other people in your community with HSP and PLS. And uh, those are the real experts, not these scientists. All ambassadors are listed by state on our website. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge and strongly thank all of you who volunteer your time to be state ambassadors. Thank you very much. You are your humongous help. Every year I also introduce the uh, board of directors, but this year because they're not in the same room with me and I can't ask them to stand up, I just want you to know that they are each very uniquely skilled individuals and we all work together in a very synchronistic, productive, fruitful, and uh, positive way. You can read about each of them on our website as well. You, are, you will be hearing and seeing our medical advisor, Dr. John K. Fink, in a few moments. Dr. Fink goes above and beyond in his quest to get to a cure for HSP and PLS. Believe it or not, the only person that has never missed one single uh, one of these conferences in our 18 years of existence is our own Dr. John K. Fink. I will now turn things over to one of our conference coordinators, uh, Greg Pruitt, who will introduce uh, a whole, uh, the start of a whole string of people that will be telling us you about our foundation. And uh, I'm introducing now uh, Jim Sheehan. Thanks, Jim. Good morning. It's good to see all of you again this morning. We appreciate all of you taking time to log in and, and uh, learn more about the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation and the work that has been going on for many years, as Frank just mentioned. Uh, we had a great turnout last night. We know a few had technical difficulties, but we're working on those with you. And, and again, thanks to all of you who joined last night. Uh, I'll be very short this morning because we wanna hear from our committee chairs and then give Dr. Fink, plenty of time to talk to you about the things that interest you the most in terms of uh, the things that you are dealing with. Uh, but it's important that we, as Frank just mentioned, getting connected with, uh, getting you on our database for all kinds of reasons. Yes, fundraising is part of that, but more importantly is getting you connected so that when potential drug trials come or research is happening, we can provide to those doctors and researchers information about people who may fit what they're researching uh, in an attempt to find biomarkers and, and uh, new research that can make a difference in our future. So I wanna encourage you once again uh, to make sure you're in our database uh, get hooked by uh, up monthly by looking at our uh, newsletter uh, and at Synapse on a quarterly basis. Get connected. And if you've got other people in your family, I shared last night uh, that there have been 12 people in my family who have had uh, uh, HSP. And over the years, some have gotten involved and some haven't, but encourage them to get involved uh, for their benefit as well as we look at research in the future. Some exciting things happened from last night's uh, event. We had a, a, a good number of people participate. I mentioned last night that we were needing state ambassadors uh, in some states. Well, before morning, uh, we had a, a new state ambassador in one of those states who was listening last night. So thank you uh, for being willing to step up and help us with that. Uh, we need state ambassadors in a couple of other states. And as we said last night, uh, we're, we're more than glad to have more than one or two or three. If you're willing to, to put in the work and the time uh, to connect with people in your state who need someone to talk to and share information with. Uh, we really need your help, so, so uh, please do that. Uh, 
Also, uh, as a result of last night, uh, and we appreciate this, there were people who uh, went on and made some donations, some who committed to monthly contributions. And to those of you who were able uh, to do that, we thank you so much as we continue to fund that research. Uh, I want to say just a word quickly about the, uh, the new SPF store, the shirts that Norma showed you just a few moments ago. Um, that's happening because uh, every year at our annual convention, we always have a shirt that uh, participants there can purchase. And in between annual conferences, we have a lot of requests from people who'd like to have uh, a t-shirt that promotes SPF and, and what their family may be dealing with. So we've just been able to establish this SPF store. It's brand new. We hope to be able to build on it in the future. And an important thing for you to know is every time you buy a shirt, uh, the company who is doing this for us makes a contribution to SPF for, for future research. So you're not only getting a shirt that you can use, uh, wear, enjoy, and promote the foundation, but uh, also working with a company who will continue to make financial contributions to our medical research effort, and that's important. And we appreciate that so, so much. Last night, you heard some exciting news from uh, Dr. Corey Brostad about some of the new research that is occurring. And uh, for time's sake, let me just remind you that, uh, as Norma said earlier, those presentations and those today uh, will be on our Facebook page and be on YouTube. So if you've got others in your family uh, who were not able to hear, please refer them to that. You might watch that with them uh, and help them understand some of the things being discussed. And uh, we look forward to emails and messages back from you who may have additional questions as we look at how we move this uh, into the future in terms of this platform uh, and information. Well, today we've uh, got a very important opportunity to hear briefly from the chair of each one of our committees. Uh, I mentioned last night our fundraising committee, our marketing committee, uh, our education committee, uh, who works with our state ambassadors, and then our scientific advisory board work with, Doc, uh, with Mark Weber. We're getting ready now to move into those committee discussions. It's my great pleasure to introduce a friend, a former president of this foundation, and we appreciate his continued work now and in the future with us on fundraising issues. And so let me uh, turn this over and thank uh, our chairperson for the fundraising committee, Mr. Jim Sheehan. Jim, take it away, sir. Thank you. Hello, and thanks for joining us. I wanted to let you guys know that I have uh, known that I've had SVG4 since I was in my mid twenties. I am now 54 years of age. I've been on the SPF board for several years. I probably should say many years now to think about that, but been involved for quite some time. My main responsibility as we speak is to help coordinate fundraising activities. So I wanted to get, kind of share some information about what we're doing and offer you to get involved with uh, feedback uh, if you like. If you have been able to make a financial contribution this year, thank you so much. I know we live in a crazy world right now, so we are very grateful for your support. If you're planning to make a contribution by year's end, we pray that you will still be able to do that and help much needed funds or medical breakthroughs. As you are probably aware, the Spastic Paraplasia Foundation is involved with several fundraising campaigns throughout the year. I wanted to go over our calendar, to share with you those uh, programs so you can have a better understanding of when they happen and what they're about. The first is a rare disease day, and this year it was February 29th. This is a national uh, awareness day for uh, nonprofits with rare diseases. Probably in the past, um, most recently, this has been more of awareness, not a fundraising opportunity. However, we had several dozen folks that uh, were able to raise money via Facebook and other uh, avenues this year. So we're looking to help uh, build more, more awareness and raising funds during these campaigns. The annual report is a report card for how the foundation has done over the past year. It reports to you and others what money was brought in, what expenses we had, what all was done. It also includes great information. Frank does a great job of providing information about what's happening with our uh, researchers and uh, future grants. So that's usually sound in the spring. We're a little behind this, this year, uh, but that should be mailed out and made electronically available to you. <clears throat> Excuse me in the next several weeks. Uh, the annual conference, which we are uh, actually participating in, as we've talked about virtual this year, and as May mentioned last night, it's not really considered a fundraising uh, uh, program because it costs more to produce that than what registration fees and sponsorship stuff. So we actually uh, don't make one half of it, but we do want to include that as an opportunity because there are people 
that do make contributions through the um, annual conference program to the foundation. So uh, next on our list is HSP and PLS Awareness Week, and that will again be August the 23rd through the 29th. This will be our second uh, year in doing this. Last year was our first to kick things off. And again, last year was more, more of awareness time. We didn't do a whole lot of fundraising other than again, several people participated in uh, raising money on Facebook. We uh, are gonna focus our attention in trying to give you ideas on how you can raise money if you wish. One of which will be the uh, virtual 5K that was mentioned by Norm earlier. I'll spend more time on that in just a little bit. Uh, next on the agenda or the calendar I should say is the Combined Federal Campaign or CFC. This is a uh, very important campaign to us and I will spend a little bit more time again on that in a few minutes. Next on the calendar is Giving Tuesday. This year will be December 1st. It's usually the first Tuesday after Thanksgiving and it's a national uh, day giving for all nonprofits that want to participate. And we do a pretty good job of uh, promoting that and getting, getting people involved. Last year, I think we raised over $30,000 in that uh, venture. So look out for more um, information about that. <clears throat> Probably the most common, most uh, known fundraising opportunity is our year-end appeal. Letters are sent out, emails are sent out uh, communi communicating to you uh, to make a contribution by the January 15th deadline. We were very fortunate to have some very generous donors that provide enough money to match upwards of $150,000. So that will that usually uh, starts mid-November and again goes through uh, January the 15th. Uh, not really something that's on the counter, but an opportunity you can help with. Uh, as you know, Synapse is a great opportunity to learn more about what, what's going on with the foundation. It's a uh, printed and electronic uh, quarterly uh, newsletter that's sent out. It does cause quite a uh, cost quite a bit to produce and mail to folks. So um, if you are receiving a mail copy, you have, you have the opportunity to contribute to help offset those costs. So I, I encourage you to do so. Uh, the last week of August, we will be celebrating our uh, HSP PLS Awareness Week. As part of that, we'll be promoting a virtual 5K like we did last year. If you do any type of physical activity to stay healthy, we hope that you will participate. More information will be emailed within the next couple of weeks as, couple of weeks as we finalize plans. But I did want to give you the heads up now in case you are willing to challenge your family and friends to participate with you. Can't run or walk very well? How about the time you spent stretching or exercising? You work with a physical therapist. That time can be all calculated into a 5K. We would like those that are planning to participate uh, and complete their uh, 5K activity to to do so before uh, Awareness Week. That way we can share pictures and information about that. So again, look for more information very soon about that. Uh, do you get emails from the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation? If not, please go to the website and register so that we can provide you the latest information. About the third week of each month, you receive an electronic newsletter from Spastic World Info. It's the, the latest information about what we're doing. The website is uh, full of great information as well. Please feel free to scroll down to the bottom of the web page and you can see the latest news articles and topics related to HSP and PLS. Updates are posted quite uh, frequently. Thanks Frank for doing that for us. Now, please listen carefully. This is probably one of the most important part of my presentation today. And again, it's the CFC or Combined Federal Campaign. It is one of the largest fundraising campaigns in America. It is available for all federal employees starting the first part of September through the middle part of uh, December. Federal employees are able to select which charities they would like to contribute to uh, in the following year. After each campaign year, CFC sends the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation money that was contributed on our behalf. Last year, over $90 million was raised. Thousands of federal employees contributed. The bad news is that less than 30 people contributed to the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation and we received just over $2,000. So, do you know any federal employees? Postal workers, military personnel, police, many other types of federal employees. If so, please reach out to them. Let them know about your disease and the work that the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation is doing to, make, to find a cure. 
then ask them to choose the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation through the election process this fall. Our CFC number is 12554. That's available on our webpage. It's also available in Synapse, newsletter, stuff like that. So if you can't remember that number, uh, we have it available for you in many locations. Begin one, two, five, five, four. Uh, federal employees can only choose charities this fall. So please help us with this great opportunity. I challenge each of you to recruit at least uh, and get a commitment from one federal employee to participate. <clears throat> The fundraising committee is also involved with reaching out to businesses, foundations, and other organizations for financial help. Last year was our first year with an organized effort, and we received $6,000. Thanks to news, our sponsors, News Corp and Hangar Foundation for, their, for approving our request. Just so you know, News Corp is a parent company of the New York Post, the Sunday Post, Harper Collins Publishing, and several other smaller uh, media uh, companies. Hanger is a leading provider of orthotic and prosthetic care. Please feel free to visit their websites to learn more information about them. Um, so, so far this year, we have submitted grants, uh, applications for close to $200,000. So hopefully this year, we'll have better luck than we had last year. Uh, I want to thank Norman Pruitt and Marion Inman for helping with providing burbage for our grants to, uh, to uh, emphasize and provide them information about our mission. You can help as well. Do you know, do you have a personal connection with an organization? Have you have done volunteer work with an organization that offers grants? If so, please let me know when someone from the fundraising committee will check it out and see if we can apply. We can help you submit the application or do it for you, whatever you think is best. Uh, the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation has monthly or recurring giving. Do you normally contribute more than once a year? Do you find yourself trying to save money uh, eight years in to make a contribution? You can determine how much you would like to contribute monthly or quarterly, $5, $10, $20, whatever you think is appropriate. The choice is yours. Then go to the Spastic Paraplegia uh, website, giving site, and uh, set this up. It's quick and easy. I hate to sound like a commercial, but you can cancel at any time. It's your choice. You will receive an email after each donation and, your, and a letter at the end of the year with your total contribution that can be used for taxes. Plan giving or bequest. <coughs> Bill, is Spastic Paraplegia Foundation set up as a beneficiary? If you would like to make a cash contribution or transfer financials, please check with your estate planner, financial planner, for details to set this up. This form of giving may be of interest if you have a family member uh, or family members affected. Not your typical contribution, but what about organ donation, specifically brain and spinal cord? We recently lost a dear friend and past Spastic Paraplegia Foundation board member that had PLS. Larry Asbury from Tennessee wanted to help with, with research, and so he donated his brain and spinal cord to science. If you'd like to do this, please make arrangements as soon as possible. If I'm not mistaken, organs have to be harvested and shipped to research facility uh, within about uh, 24 hours or so. So please let us know if you're interested. We will be glad to get you in touch with a uh, research facility. Even though there are a lot of distractions out there, the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation is working hard to generate money to fund high quality research. Thanks again if you have contributed to the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation. Looking forward to many more contributing this year so that we can fund as many research grants as possible this next year. Mark Weber will be discussing more about research grant process in a bit, but the SVF board will be meeting next week to determine what we'll do uh, this year. We should be able to fund at least five grants this year due to the tremendous success we had last year. Thank you. If you'd like more information uh, or would like to provide feedback about the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation fundraising, please let me know. My email is jimshion at gmail.com. That's J-I-M-S-H-E-O-R-N at gmail.com. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to turn it over to my friend, Tim Krogan, who will discuss the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation marketing activities. Have a good weekend. Hello, everybody. How you doing out there? Can you see me? All right, Jim. All right. 
Hey, uh, remember me from last year's uh, virtual uh, 5K uh, during Awareness Week? Well, um, I was the one pushing Tina um, all over the, um, uh, the beach last year and uh, having a lot of fun, raising awareness, talking to people. You know, that's my thing, to talk to people about HSP and PLS and the SPF Foundation. I wanted to talk to you today about, you know, what we've been working on in our marketing committee uh, over the past year. Uh, we did some targeted um, advertising uh, to the American Association of Neurologists at their annual convention in Philadelphia. Uh, we reached uh, a membership of over 14,000 members with a message about HSP and PLS and where for them to go to get more information about diagnosing HSP and PLS, as well as research. And of course, that was the SPF website. We also did a campaign uh, both digitally and in person to the American Neurological Association. Uh, that's a group of educators and researchers uh, to make our presence known to them and to promote the research opportunities that are available via grants from SPF. Um, the basis of these advertising efforts was to drive the members uh, of these national groups to our website, uh, to inform them of our rare diseases and to educate them on our abilities um, as a foundation dedicated to research and a cure. What was really cool about this was that we saw a 50 to a 100% increase in website traffic during these campaigns. So we know that our message uh, reached them, okay? Um, speaking um, of our website, uh, we hope you enjoy the new look and the ease of navigation to find resources uh, to help you in your fight against HSP and PLS. And another cool thing we did was we also worked with John Staley, the editor of the Synapse, to give our newsletter a contemporary look and uh, ease of reading. Um, please note that all of our synapses have been digitized and are now available for download and reading at your convenience. Uh, it's a really great way to see historically how things have advanced over the past 18 years. Um, we are constantly working on new ways to get our message out to the masses um, about the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation, the work that we're doing, um, both now on a national, but now we're moving into a global scale. Uh, it's exciting to see a lot of participants in today's uh, virtual conference that are joining us from around the world. And it's really nice to know that we're getting support, we're reaching more people, we're spreading our message, and we're bringing interest from neurologists and researchers to us so that we can tell them our story and help help you fight the fight that um, we are trying to all fight every day, trying to find a cure for these rare diseases. Um, I know that wasn't a lot of super detail like Jim gives because Jim is the detail man, but what I wanted to let you know is that we're working out there behind the scenes every day, trying to get our message out to the world to let them know that we are here, we are available, and we are working really, really hard on finding a cure for HSP and PLS. So guess what? Now it's time for me to introduce to you the fabulous Tina Krogan and her report on the happenings of the Education Committee. Tina? Thank you, Tim. My name is Tina Krogan, and as you can tell, I'm in the same room with Tim Krogan. I'm married to him. So um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what the Education Committee has been doing, what it does. Our goal is to make the information about the HSP and PLS more current and accessible to patients medical professionals, lawmakers, and the public. We work to update the information on our new look, the website, 
We cleaned up and streamlined the menu items to make finding information easier. We updated our famous HSP booklet and the PLS guide and our words to know with the most current content. These are all on our website. The committee has created a new trifold brochure that can also be downloaded and printed for you to share with your doctor and other contacts. We have been working with the state ambassadors by sending them lots of information so that uh, the found, what the foundation has been doing has also been a way for us to hear from them about the goings on in their states. They are able to share with us their successes. They can network with each other. And finally, we still need to have ambassadors in these states, Indiana and Alaska. So please let us know if you would be interested. You don't have to live in that, those states. We're trying to get multiple ambassadors in each state. So you are able to contact us if you're interested through the website. And now I have the pleasure to introduce to you Mark Weber, who is the SPF's chairman of the Research Grant Committee. Mark, are you out there? Can you see me at all? Oh, no. Finally, now you can see me. Uh, my name is Mark Weber. Um, I have SPG uh, 12. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, our research grant program. Um, and hopefully, if I can get this thing to work, um, I'm going to bring up a slideshow. Uh, so just give me a minute, and hopefully this will function. But it's not. Oh, it is. Okay. Um, so let me talk to you about... Uh, our research grant program. We started issuing grants in uh, 2003. So this will be our um, 17th year of doing research grants. When we started, um, we only awarded $80,000. Um, we had two $40,000 grants. They were a year each. One of them went to uh, John Fink, uh, MD out of the University of Michigan and the other one to Doug Marchuk out of Duke. Um, last year, we awarded just under 600,000. Um, we gave a total of four grants at roughly $150,000 each for a total of two years. The grants went to the following, uh, Dr. Al Chalabi of uh, King's College in London. He's doing a uh, genetics and environmental uh, study of primary lateral sclerosis. Um, we also gave to Dr. Fakari, uh, Ibrahimi rather Fakari at uh, Harvard Medical School. Uh, he's looking at human ner uh, nerve cells, neurons, uh, from children with a particular type of HSP. Uh, Dr. Lee, who's also using uh, human neurons, uh, she is now at the University of Illinois uh, College of Medicine. She used to be at University of Connecticut, where we funded her as well. Um, and lastly, if this thing moves, um, we are funding Dr. Sonderman. He's in, uh, he's at Cornell. Um, and he's pr 
pretty much close to wrapping up his work. So what I really want to talk to you about is how do we do the research grant program? How do we basically uh, find people to fund? So the issue is everybody else on the board fundraises. How do we take your money to find a cure um, for PLS and HSP? The answer is simple. First, we ask researchers to provide proposals. We get them, we evaluate them, and then we award the top proposals. When we ask, we put out an email. Last year, we put out an email to over 330 researchers. This year, it'll be more than that. I don't know how many yet, and we don't know quite the exact deadline, rather, of uh, when we expect proposals to be received. It'll be sometime in October. Once we get the proposals, we have a scientific advisory board and they review all the proposals. The, uh, I'll do this quickly. The chairman of our scientific advisory board is Dr. Martha Nance. She's out in the Park Nicolette Clinic in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. Um, also on the board, Dr. Angelotti, he's at Stanford. Um, Dr. Corey Brostad, he's with Covance uh, Genomics Laboratories. He's one of the vice presidents there, his PhD. Um, Dr. Mark Gudisblatt, he's a clinician on Long Island. Michael Kruer um, is uh, at the Arizona State University in Phoenix. Mark Ledoux is University of Memphis. Dr. Moretti, uh, he is at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. A new member of the Scientific Advisory Board is Dr. Orthman Murphy. She's at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. O'Sullivan, she's in Ireland. Um, Dr. Melissa Rolls previously got one of our grants. Uh, she is at Penn State. Dr. Jacinda Sampson is at Stanford. And lastly, another new member, Dr. Santorelli, is at the University of Pisa in Italy. So that's the uh, scientific advisory board that we currently have. Um, we take the proposals and divvy them up so that each proposal is reviewed by four scientific advisory board members. They are ranked by everybody. And then our chairperson um, compiles um, the ranks for each, the scores for each proposal, averages them, and then lists them from the top ranked on down. In making our awards, PLS proposals do not compete with HSP proposals. So we fund the top ranked PLS proposal, the top ranked HSP proposal, and then we go down for each type of proposals. Um, once we make the awards, we send out a contract. Uh, the researcher that gets an award signs the contract, sends it back. Uh, they immediately get the first fifth of the grant we get progress reports every six months, and then the researcher gets, or their institution gets another fifth of the award until they are done. Um, as a result of our program, we have had uh, our researchers publish in a number of prestigious medical journals. I've listed some of them um, there. And the key, of course, is that we're all seeking this day, the day when we know what causes our disorders and we know how to treat them and we cure them. That's what we're looking for. And let me, uh, let me get out of share. Okay. Um, one thing I wanted to talk to you about is in a couple of days, our board is going to be 
um, voting on which proposals to fund. Um, I indicated in the beginning of my talk that back in 2003, we funded $80,000 worth of grants. This year, we are expected to fund a minimum of 10 times that, 800,000 this year. Um, so I will have the joy of telling a bunch of researchers that their proposals were funded. That will be followed by the not joyful um, task of having to tell the rest of them that they weren't funded. Some of those proposals were very close to getting funded, but they weren't close enough. And every several years, I find out that researchers had to stop being researchers because uh, they couldn't get funded. Um, obviously, the more money we get from your donations, the more we can fund. Um, the less people I have to tell that you're not getting funded. And more importantly, the less people that drop out of research. Um, so I want to thank you all um, for the money you've given. Um, being able to issue at least $800,000 worth of grants in a few days, um, that's really something. And that's because of all of you. So thank you. Um, the next person I think I'm supposed to introduce um, is Hank going to be? I can't tell. I was told to introduce Dr. Fink. Um, so I'm going to introduce Dr. Fink. Uh, if I'm wrong, um, then... That is correct, Mark. It is correct. Okay, thanks. Um, Dr. John Fink is a professor at the Department of Neurology at the University of Michigan uh, Medical School. He's also director of their uh, neurogenetic disorders program there. Um, he is board certified in neurology. He is also board certified in genetics. Um, he uh, investigates the molecular basis of inherited disorders of the nervous system. Um, he is probably one of the leading, if not the leading, uh, researcher in the field of PLS, PLS research in the world. Um, I just found out today that there's a publication called The Best Doctors in America. In order to get on that publication, um, physicians are elected onto it by their peers. Dr. Fink has been elected every single year since 2001, 19 straight years. He's the medical advisor of the scientific, of the uh, Spastic Paraplegia Foundation. Um, he is a true gem. Um, introduce you to Dr. John Fink. There you are. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Are we live? Yes, sir, you are. Go ahead, please. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad to be here. It's a, it's a unique experience that for everyone, both uh, presenters and uh, participants, to do it uh, in this format. Um, but we're professionals, and we will make this the best ever. Now, I do want to say I've got a... I need to share my screen. So let me take a second to power that up. Not ready yet. Uh, okay, sharing, is it, is it sharing with you? Yes, Good. yes sir, it is. Okay, so I'm gonna, I, 
I'm not going to fill up every available moment with educational material. So, so first of all, there was some trouble hearing me last night. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. It's perfect. Okay, good. Uh, so there was some trouble last um, with the uh, slides and glitches, but I'm not going to fill up every available moment with prepared remarks for education. This is not supposed to be, my presentation is not going to be everything that a person needs to know or wants to know. It's not, it's going to be some essential information that's going to be starting points for conversations. So, um, but I want to make this one point here that even though we're not in the same room, we're all participating in this and we are, and this conference is a highly diverse group of individuals. I want to take a moment to reflect on this because for a number of reasons, but one, it's when we're having a conversation, there are multiple conversations happening simultaneously. For example, sometimes I'm talking with individuals who are affected with this condition. Other times I may be talking with clinicians or scientists who are studying this condition. So let's just reflect on all the various people that are here, all the stakeholders, all the participants. This is not a, an audience um, observation. It's more of a group participation process. So we have people today with us in this uh, video conference who are affected with uh, HSP and PLS adults. And they've had symptoms for many years and uh, they're very familiar with, with the symptoms and they're working out, continuously working out strategies to adapt uh, to these challenges. There are also individuals with us today that are just now developing symptoms. And this is a different experience and um, for everybody and the, 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 uh, the newly affected or the more recently affected individuals wrestle with, uh, with many different um, issues like fear, what's gonna happen, reading about it on the internet now that what, and so forth, what can they predict? There are also many different types of HSP and PLS and uh, sometimes they have different symptoms, sometimes they have overlapping symptoms. And among these, there are some people, I mean, we've heard several numbers today. We've heard SPG 12, we've heard SPG 4, and so we'll, we will hear other numbers as well, other types of HSP. There are people who know the molecular cause, the genetic type. And there are people who don't. And sometimes they don't know because they haven't had testing but often they've had testing and they, don't, they still don't know. The testing didn't show anything. There are children and teenagers, and as was pointed out uh, last night, um, there's emerging Facebook groups for this. I think that's wonderful um, for, for teenagers, young adults, children um, to uh, share and learn from each other peer to peer how to, what their experiences are. And then there are also children who are affected in a different way, and that is they don't have symptoms, but their parent has symptoms. And there's a lot of, cons they don't escape all of HSP and PLS. They, uh, they grow up wondering if they're gonna be affected. The parents are concerned about that. They're growing up in a household where this is um, a very uninvited presence. And uh, then there are parents and siblings who may not be affected and spouses and friends. And as I say to, with us today and last night, there are representatives of, uh, of a biotech companies who are looking to develop treatments. They're here learning about HSP and PLS, trying to, to understand what are the opportunities to develop therapy and what should be done. And I go through this list in some detail because I, I, it's very important. I feel strongly that all of these diverse, and this, there are other positions as well, but this diversity is really an important resource that we need to utilize because everybody's experience, children's experience, the psychological effects, the uh, emotional effects, the school learning effects of, the, of dealing with the condition and the 
and the um, medications and on and on and on. Everybody's experience we need to understand. It helps our total understanding of HSP and PLS and it advances our ability to provide information, to provide care and support for each other and to develop real and sustaining therapies. So the diversity is very important. Now, uh, why are two conditions, primary lateral sclerosis and hereditary spastic paraplegia, why are they in the same foundation? Okay, now many, uh, don't raise your hand because I can't see them. But uh, uh, so they're in, this, it, they're in the same foundation because fundamentally, these are very related conditions. That is, the symptoms of these conditions, we used to say they were distinct, HSP and PLS. That was then, but now there are many types of HSP that start out as HSP and evolve into what looks like PLS. There are many types. And if there's a clinicians or scientists on this call, you can Google or search uh, HSP with bulbar symptoms. With, that means with speech involvement or HSP with upper extremity involvement. And there's at least a dozen or more types of HSP that have that. And they would then meet criteria for PLS, but they're in fact um, genetic forms of HSP. So there are, HSP and PLS are sometimes distinct and sometimes overlapping. And there are many people on this call that I know have been diagnosed as PLS, that was the condition was later re-diagnosed as HSP and vice versa. People were originally diagnosed as HSP and had the diagnosis changed to PLS. Besides the fact that the symptoms can overlap, importantly, these conditions share similar pathologic changes. And I'll discuss that. I won't show you any pathology, but I'll talk about that a little more. And besides the fact that they share similar pathologic changes or, or, or owing to that concept is that uh, we think that understanding the causes of this type of nerve degeneration will advance of one of these, finding the cause of PLS and treating PLS that will help HSP and vice versa. So these are very much um, sister conditions. They're not the same. But if you take a step back and you say, well, there are at least 100 different types of HSP, and there are at least four or five different types of PLS. So, um, you know, how all of the HSPs are sister conditions to each other, and the PLSs are sister conditions to, to each other. And um, so they're all, they're all related, large group of conditions. Okay, now, we, I said that there, there's a, this is as close as I'm gonna to get to a pathology slide, but I said that they're related, that HSP and PLS share um, pathology. And uh, they do. And what we're talking about here in this schematic is these motor neurons, a motor neuron, upper motor neuron. Imagine that we have uh, two um, cables, two big uh, extension cords. And one cable starts out in the brain, I've depicted that here in red, and goes to the spinal cord and terminates in the spinal cord, either in the brainstem or in the cervical cord or in the thoracic cord. One, one cable starts in the brain and goes to the spinal cord. And then other cables plug into that and go out to the muscles. So the one that starts in the brain and goes down the spinal cord, we call that the upper motor neurons. The nerve bundles begin in the brain and end in the spinal cord. That's the upper motor neurons. And from them, plugged into that cable, are other cables that go from, that go into the muscles. So they're, there are um, uh, nerves cable that go to the muscles in the face and in the tongue and in the swallowing and muscles that, and nerves that go out to the, uh, um, for example, to the legs or to the arms. These are the lower motor neurons. I've depicted them in green. And uh, HSP and PLS are predominantly, we used to say exclusively, but as we've learned more over the past number of years, they're predominantly upper motor neuron disorders, not exclusively, but predominantly. Now, for uh, this is Neurology 101. 
And uh, uh, so Neurology 101 is that the signs of upper motor neuron disturbance are increased reflexes in clonus. Clonus in the ankles, repetitive uh, movement of the ankle when the ankle is bent back or could be of the knee sometimes. Spasticity is a, is a typical sign of upper motor neuron impairment. Slowness, uh, we'll talk more about that. Decreased agility, what's agility? Well, the ability to make very quick and very small, precise movements. That's what we're talking about. And weakness. Uh, Babinski signs or upgoing toes, that's part of this process, but uh, we, that, that's, uh, that's also part of an upper motor neuron sign, a sign of upper motor neuron disturbance. What about the lower motor neurons? What are their signs when they're disturbed? Weakness is a big factor. You may or may not get weakness or significant weakness with upper motor neuron involvement, but with lower motor neuron involvement, if it's significant degree, you will get weakness. You'll get atrophy. There'll be shrinkage of the muscle. Muscle fasciculations are a particular kind of twitching uh, that you can see or feel, and they have a, an, uh, a correlate on uh, EMG, electromyography, and um, the reflex will be reduced. In comparison to the upper motor neuron, the reflex will be increased or very brisk. Okay. Now, in addition to this, HSP and sometimes PLS, we used to think it wasn't involved in PLS, and now uh, we, it, it can be present. But typically in HSP, there's an additional involvement beyond the upper motor neuron, and that is the position sense. And I've drawn that in blue. These are sensory fibers, whereas the motor fibers descend from the brain to the spinal cord and from the spinal cord out to the muscle, the sensory fibers, in this case conveying a position sense or proprioception from the legs up to the spinal cord and then to the brain. And there is some impairment of these um, position sense. And why is that important? Well, a couple things. It says that what's happening in HSP and sometimes in PLS is not a pure motor phenomena. It's not only the motor neurons because it's also these sensory neurons, but it's not all sensory neurons. It's typically not, I mean, there are, there are so many types of HSP that you have to be careful about making generalizations, but uh, we're talking about a particular kind of sensory impairment um, affecting the uh, position sense. And what these, so it's not strictly motor, it's motor and sensory, and what unites these is the fact that, and this is a, a, what we call the central dogma. And when we use the, that term, it reminds us to say, it's not entirely proven, it's a concept, and it doesn't apply in all circumstances. That's the, the, uh, the small print, but the central dogma of HSP and PLS is that the process involves degeneration or failure to form adequately the ends of the, long, of the long nerves. So the nerves from the brain to the, the thoracic cord, these long red fibers, they degenerate down here at the bottom at their end. And the sensory nerve that carries the position sense, it degenerates at the top up here. These are the longest nerves, longest motor nerves in the central nervous system, and they degenerate most at their ends. And these are the longest uh, uh, sensory nerves in the central nervous system, and they degenerate at their ends. And so we think the central dogma is that this is a length dependent process that particularly affects the long nerves in the central nervous system. Now beyond that, there are so many different varieties of HSP that, um, that so many different flavors and, and um, different symptoms and different involvements of peripheral nerve and muscle and, and uh, vision and, and, and cerebellum, and, but this, these are the common parts of, of most types of HSP. And the reason for going in this detail is that um, ALS is a disorder that does not involve sensation. And we said that sensory involvement is very mild, but very common in HSP, but ALS does not involve sensory involvement. And ALS involves both upper motor neurons in red 
and lower motor neurons. And in HSP and PLS, in general, except for some types, there's always that caveat, in HSP and PLS in general is predominantly an upper motor neuron problem without lower motor neuron involvement, except in, in selected types. Okay, now, what about PLS? They're, these are cousins, HSP and, and, and uh, PLS are cousins. They're not the same, but no two types of HSP are the same. PLS is, a, is typically a, the most common form of PLS begins in adulthood. Let's say after age 50, uh, it can begin earlier than that. Uh, for example, in the 30s. Um, and there is a childhood form or more than one childhood form. But the classic form of PLS is something that begins in the 50s or 60s and progresses slowly. It begins with leg uh, difficulty, with difficulty walking, with tightness. Um, and then slowly over years, there's a progression of symptoms to involve the upper extremities, the hands, buttoning and grip and dexterity, and then speech and swallowing over years. And uh, um, there are different types of PLS. Sometimes it begins in the upper extremities, for example. But, um, and as I say, sometimes it begins in childhood. So PLS is itself not a single condition. It's a syndrome. Uh, what do we mean syndrome? Well, syndrome is a group of symptoms and signs. So if you have a fever and a cough, well, that's a kind of a syndrome of an upper respiratory infection, but it's not specific to COVID-19 or it's not specific to strep infection. It's non-specific. It's a syndrome that's associated with an upper respiratory tract infection. So these, these, when we talk about syndromes, PLS is a syndrome. It's a common group of symptoms. For example, spasticity that, that begins in the legs, then the arms, then speech and swallowing. But that's not unique to PLS only. It, and, and there are different types. Anyways, uh, last year, uh, we talked about this at the conference and Dr. Mitsumoto uh, participated in that. There was a uh, conference last May, a year ago, 13 months ago, and uh, in Philadelphia. And um, it was a conference for investigators of uh, primary lateral sclerosis of PLS from all over the world. And it, it's important. This is the second time there's been an international conference. The first one um, that I, I participated in it uh, was uh, 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 in uh, California approximately 20 years prior. And uh, Dr. Uh, Sadiq from, uh, from the Northwestern University was the chair of that. And it, it was, but a couple things were very important. What has changed in 20 years? Well, one thing that we've finally come out with now is, and it, this should be published. I looked on, I, I received uh, galley proofs yesterday. This should be published uh, for the, in the medical literature within the next few months. But we finally come out with diagnostic criteria to diagnose primary lateral sclerosis. Okay, now why is that important? That seems like we're at square one. There, we, we wanna be at, we wanna be close to the finish line. But this is important. The, the other things happened at that meeting, but this is, this is one notable event that happened at the outcome of that meeting. Why is this important to get diagnostic criteria for primary lateral sclerosis? Well, okay, so first of all, what are those criteria? Signs of progressive upper motor neuron impairment. We've already talked about upper motor neurons. They're spasticity, hyperreflexia, slowness, decreased agility and precision, weakness, but not atrophy, involving three body regions. So for example, both legs and an arm, or two arms and speech and swallowing with no or minimal lower motor neuron disturbance. That's the lower motor neuron we talked about. Other ex disorders being excluded. Now, what's, the, what's, what's so important about these criteria? Well, if, oops, sorry. If we wanna do research, and we do wanna do research, and we are doing research, to find 
the cause of primary lateral sclerosis and treatment, then we need to get people that have PLS in a, in a study, what we call a, a research cohort. And if any condition we're studying, any, it uh, doesn't matter, investigating any condition requires that the subjects have that specific condition rather than be simply a group of individuals with various conditions in which some of them have one condition and some have other conditions and the investigator doesn't know which is which. So we need to have, we need to have what we call a uniform cohort. Everybody has to have PLS. We can't have ALS and HSP and other conditions commingled. It's got to be, or other conditions, multiple sclerosis, other conditions that might uh, resemble PLS, for example, or B12 deficiency. I don't want to get into the differential diagnosis, but we need to have a pure cohort in order to do research. And uh, having diagnostic, agreed on diagnostic criteria permits a, a uniform cohort to be ascertained. That's the beginning of, of, uh, res of, uh, of this kind of research. More importantly, when uh, grants have been submitted to NIH for PLS research, they ask questions like, what biomarkers are you going to study? Well, we need to get uniform cohorts in order to then investigate biomarkers. And they say, well, what about the natural history? How does it progress year after year, month after month? He said, well, again, the same answer. We need to have uniform cohorts to uh, to, uh, to establish the natural history. So, and there have been grant applications to NIH and these have been some of the um, critiques and these, and so these move us ahead in responding to those critiques. And the, the other part that's kind of uh, more uh, esoteric, I suppose, is that having 50 investigators in a room um, and coming up with diagnostic criteria, it advances the narrative that PLS is its own clinical syndrome and is not simply a part of ALS. And that, um, uh, that uh, is a, a concept. So in this room, in, uh, in this audience and today in this foundation, it, that, it, that seems to be kind of uh, something we take for granted. But around the world, many neurologists have grown up with the concept that PLS is um, a, really a form of ALS. And, and, and we're, 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 we are uh, saying it's not part of the ALS spectrum, it's its own condition. So that the, 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 there is a lot of implications of having criteria for PLS. Now, uh, I wanna talk about developing treatments for PLS and HSP. And I'm gonna go into some detail here and, um, and then we'll talk about a, a, a to-do list. And uh, I made this to-do list some time ago and then I revised it and then I revised it. Every time I look at it, I revise it. So it's, it's a very much a, a work in progress. Um, and uh, so what kind of treatment should we develop? Well, we wanna prevent the disorder. That's coming from the parent who has the condition and their child's at risk. Or coming from the child's perspective that never wants to experience a condition that they've inherited a gene for and it hasn't, yet manifested symptoms. We want to prevent the disorder, okay? We want to treat the underlying process, or the processes, it's plural. In other words, we all, but we also want to treat the symptoms, okay? So really, in fact, we want all of this. And, and it's hard to say which is more important. I don't think we can say which is more important. I, I wouldn't say which. I'd say they are equally important. We want to treat the symptoms. We want to stop the process. We want to prevent the disorder. Okay. So we have big goals here. We don't just want to treat the symptoms. We want to, we want to go more than that. Now, 
what are we going to treat? And uh, basically what I'm doing here at this point in the discussion is I'm opening up the, uh, I, uh, everybody at this point is getting insight into the research um, laboratory. When you sit down and you say, I want to cure PLS and I want to cure HSP. You say, great. Well, what part of HSP or what are my targets? What am I going to cure? Let's talk about it. Let's take these on one at a time. Let's say we want to prevent the condition. We don't want it to begin. Well, and this is not the only way, but this is one way. There is something I like called uh, gene correction through CRISPR, for instance, of eggs and early stage embryos. And this is possible. This is done in the laboratory and laboratory animals and it works. Okay, so you can have a mutation in an egg or an early stage embryo and you can correct that mutation. And uh, you can revert the mutation back to normal. And you can stop the organism from developing that, the, the trait associated with that mutation. All right, so that's possible. It's done in laboratories, but it's, but it's not established to be safe in humans. And it raises important ethical concerns about human genetic manipulation. All right, so first of all, it's safety. Let's talk about safety. You're doing a gene manipulation, and this is early days in the work here. I mean, not, it's been going on for years, but it's not 15 years of this, or of, of human, manipula human uh, manipulation of this. And I mean, that we don't have people who have been born and they're now 50 years old, and they have shown no deleterious effects. We don't have that, we don't have that experience. So, uh, does it, are, there any, are there any immediate consequences of this in terms of safety? Are there any long-term consequences in terms of, of uh, safety? I don't know. And we don't know as, a, as, a, as a medical science, this, the long-term safety of this gene correction in eggs to prevent the condition um, <clears throat> has not been established. But the other thing is this, the other concerns are which conditions should this technology be applied to? Only for conditions that are fatal? Then you say, well, the, the oops, uh, geez, I have trouble here. Uh, like uh, fatal conditions, then if, if it weren't perfectly safe or was unknown safety, but it might, it might um, keep someone alive and, and so on, it might be justified if it were for a fatal condition. What about for a non-fatal condition? What about for a condition that uh, has a late age of onset? What about for uh, non-medical conditions for physical or psychological traits that are of non-medical consequence. For example, some people have short stature. That's not really a disease. Uh, uh, should it be, should, you know, and I don't want to get into all the, all the examples of this, but, but uh, should it be done for only fatal conditions and so on? Who should decide? And we talked about the safety. And then how widely available should this kind of technology be? That is, should it be part of everyone's health plan? Should it be, and I don't get into uh, the disparities of, of uh, health um, care and particularly genetic services are, are high on the list of, of, uh, of not being dis, um, distributed evenly through our society. I'm not going to talk about that. But who, with regard to the ethics, who represents the rights of the individual whose genome is being permanently modified? The parents only? A panel of parents, of ethicists, of clergy, of scientists, and legal experts? That would diminish then the parents' vote. But it, would, it would says that society, in other words, it says that society has an interest in making these decisions. So my point is, we're only on step one. Gene correction is possible. It's not been proved to have long-term safety for humans, and it, is, it has very significant ethical concerns, and uh, that's where it stands. Now, let's talk about other treatments. Let's not talk about preventing the process. I didn't talk about, uh, about 
prevention in terms of uh, a pre-implantation genetic testing, that is, um, which is possible. If somebody says, I have a, a gene, I have a type, I have a, a, genetic, a genetic condition and the gene is known, there are um, genetic counseling uh, methods, what we call pre-implantation testing, for example, that involve in vitro fertilization and um, then testing um, the eight cell stage embryo to determine if it has the mutation or not, and then re-implanting for pregnancy the embryos that do not have that. And so it doesn't involve termination of pregnancy or an abortion. It is involved in uh, pre-implantation testing. So you only, the, the, the woman only becomes pregnant with the, um, with the uh, embryos that do not have that mutation. And that's done. Uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's possible. Um, anytime a gene mutation is identified, um, particularly for dominantly inherited disorders. Um, so it's possible, and that's, that's, that's something that's widely available, um, not in every medical center, but, but widely available in every state. Now, that's also part of prevention, I guess, but uh, let's, let's talk about treatment targets. We're talking about treating, treating the underlying disease process itself. Okay, so um, if we know what the gene is and we know what the gene does, then we can say, well, this gene, this function of the gene is not happening correctly. We're gonna develop treatments that counteract that problem. Okay, so let's talk about spastin. Spastin is the single most common cause of hereditary spastic paraplegia. It's about 40% of dominantly inherited HSP. Um, so it's, a, it's after spastin, and uh, as, as was said the other night, after spastin and paraplegia and SPG7, uh, SPG11, after we get through the SPG3A, once you get past the four or five common ones, everything else is one or 2% or 3%, some, some are more, but really they're, the, the other, other uh, 100 or approximately 100 different types are then a small, um, re represent relatively small um, percentages of the total. Now, but let's talk about spastin. It's a common, it's a very, it's the most common, single most common type. Spastin mutations have uh, several different functions. Okay, several different functions. Now, and I'm, now I'm speaking to scientists and uh, who are interested in developing therapies for spastin. And, uh, uh, and I want to emphasize that some of, so spastin is involved in microtubule severing. And spastin by, is involved in, in the endoplasmic reticulum maturation. I'm not going to get into detail of that here. It's a, it's a very important part of the cell and several HSP proteins are also involved in endoplasmic reticulum maturation. And I know that just sounds like, uh, uh, you know, jargon, but the point is, is that there's A, B, C, D. All you have to remember from this is that spastin doesn't have a single function. It has multiple functions. And some of these functions might be related. So maybe it's not one through four, maybe it's one through three, okay? but there are multiple functions of spastin. So spastin is kind of like, uh, I wouldn't say a, like a Swiss army knife. Now a Swiss army knife that has 13 blades, no, but maybe at least three or four blades, okay? So spastin has multiple functions. And that concept here, that spastin has multiple functions, that's very typical of, of many of the HSP proteins is that they have one function, but that's not their only function. And uh, I use the analogy, uh, what's the function of a hammer? You know, uh, a claw hammer. Well, you say it's to put nails in. Well, yes, but a claw hammer is also used to take nails out. So, or uh, you understand. So um, it, uh, it, it has 
it has uh, uh, multiple functions. And the question is, which of these functions do we have to change to treat the disease? Okay, now, fine. I know this is getting into the weeds here, but there's a, I just want to spend a moment on this. The other part is, which cells should we treat? In the other, previous slide, I talked about these long neurons, that they are the ones, the upper motor neurons, that they're the ones that have the problem. Okay, so we talk about neurons. I understand. But neurons are supported and nurtured by their environment, by the cells that surround them. And we can injure those neurons, we can kill those neurons by causing disease in the supporting cells. So where do we need to, what do we need to treat? Do we need to treat the neurons themselves? Do we need to treat the supporting cells or the glia? That actually means glue or, or a substance that, that surrounds these neurons, but it's not, it's not just an amorphous uh, glue, it's, uh, it's cellular material, cells. Uh, so do we need to make the glia healthy to keep the neurons healthy? It is primarily a neuron problem, but there are, t there are I can, I can, uh, I know at least two types of HSP where the problem is not, where the neurons degenerate, but the problem is not in the neurons, the problem is in the glia. Now I know two types. Um, how, what kind of, how generalized is that concept? I can't say, but every type of HSP should be studied to know, is it the neurons are the primary problem? Or are they secondarily involved or is it the glia and vice versa? Okay, now. Once we figure out the process we're gonna, that we're gonna um, treat, we have to think about in terms of treating the process. Well, let's talk about gene therapy, okay? And uh, Dr. Brostad last night talked about this and he talked about, and, and so I'm just uh, echoing his comments about different approaches to gene therapy. So for example, there's gene replacement. So if a, if a gene, if the mutation renders the function of that gene, uh, uh, if, the, if the mutation destroys the function, then a gene therapy would be to replace or augment that function. On the other hand, let's say that the gene mutation doesn't destroy the, the, the function of that protein, but it makes that protein toxic. Well, now gene therapy should be targeted to suppress that function. The example would be this. Let's say you have a, a and I know that this analogy is, is not perfect, but let's say you have a car and the battery's dead. The battery's got a mutation and it's called the battery gene. And there's a mutation in the battery gene and the battery does not have enough power. So that mutation has destroyed the function or reduced the function of the battery beyond a certain level and the car can't start. Well, in this analogy, you could do a gene therapy and you could put in three healthy overexpressed batteries. You don't have to remove that battery. Um, and you can just put in line, I probably actually electrically you'd have to remove the battery, but I don't get into that. But um, in this analogy, you could just transfer in three healthy batteries, not removing the battery, and the car would start. Because you've done a battery gene therapy. You've put in the healthy battery, you didn't remove the other one, you just put in healthy overexpressed battery. Okay, now let's say another example. The problem is that the battery, a different battery mutation, and you go to turn the key and the battery explodes. Okay, battery explodes, car catches on fire. That's a problem. Now, in that case, we have a toxic gain of function. I don't know if the battery is out of uh, electricity or not, that's irrelevant it has a toxic property. And in that example, that analogy, the treatment is not to add additional batteries. The treatment is to suppress the action of the bad mutated battery, to silence that, okay? And these are not, uh, 
mutually exclusive. Sometimes you have to silence the toxic gene and then add the healthy gene. You do both together. So, but the point is, what Dr. Uh, Brustad was talking about last night, this um, uh, N. Lorem study that's accepted, and I'm getting ahead of myself because I'll mention this later, it's accepted one person, maybe two, with SPG4 for their studies. That approach is um, a gene suppression approach. That approach is not a gene replacement approach. And so that depends on the theory that um, the gene is, the mutation is, is uh, pathogenic or causes a problem because it is damaging and we need to suppress it. Okay. Uh, okay, let's skip, move ahead. Now, okay, what about the symptoms? And if you thought that, and that, that was probably the most technical thing we're gonna get into. So I think if we all are still friends after that kind of uh, technical tour de force, then, then we're doing okay. But uh, what about the symptoms? Okay, now let's think about Parkinson's or let's think about diabetes. You know, well, let's see, Parkinson's a better example. In Parkinson's, people, uh, it used to be a fatal condition. And uh, I'm not saying it's never a fatal condition now, but um, the ability to treat people with Parkinson's with levodopa, with L-dopa, that the body makes into dopamine, has been life-saving. And uh, that was introduced uh, really in like early 70s. And uh, that's been life-saving. You cannot underestimate the impact of giving levodopa to people with Parkinson's. It's not perfect. Other therapies are needed. Many people are, uh, after five or eight years, it, it is uh, no longer as effective. I'm not trying to say it's a, it's a cure, but it has been a significant uh, benefit to millions of people. Now, the point is, is that that therapy that has been life-changing for many people does not address the underlying problem in Parkinson's. Parkinson's is a slowly progressive nerve degeneration of specific nerves in the brainstem. And levodopa treatment does not keep those, does not make those cells come back to life. Levodopa, but when those cells die, they have certain, they create certain neurochemical deficiency, particularly in dopamine, and we can replace that chemical. We can't stop the nerve degeneration in Parkinson's, but we can treat very effectively for many years um, the consequences of that nerve degeneration. So, one thing we would want to think about, we don't want to underestimate that the, uh, the value of symptomatic treatments, because for conditions that are very slowly progressive, even more slowly progressive than Parkinson's, maybe if we could treat the symptoms as effectively, we might get long-term benefit, even though we haven't changed the, uh, or, or stopped the underlying process. Now, let's talk about that. What about what symptoms should we treat? Okay, so this is, uh, uh, you know, you, you, know, you uh, have an option here. Let's talk about spasticity. Well, we have a lot to learn about how to treat spasticity. Right now, um, in general terms, we're really using the same approach that we've been using for spasticity for the past 50 years. In general, the same group of chemicals. Um, we use baclofen, which ultimately was, is a cousin of Valium, and Valium was used to treat spinal cord injury and, and uh, spasticity after, with multiple sclerosis in, since the 60s or before. And now we use baclofen, it's not as sedating, but it's very similar mechanistically. Or we use tizanidine, or we use dantrium, they're, they're different drugs. I'm not trying to, I don't wanna go into the chemistry of each of them. Um, but, um, 
So we can treat spasticity. But there's a new, there are, there's new, uh, uh, by, by new, I mean in the past five or eight years, new knowledge about the chemistry of spasticity. And this, this knowledge opens up new drug possibilities. Specifically, I'm thinking about the serotonin receptor. And, and not, I mean, the serotonin has seven different receptors and there are different types of receptors in the brain and spinal cord and so on and so forth. But blocking this receptor, one subtype of the serotonin receptor seems to treat spasticity very effectively. And we're not doing that. And why aren't we doing that? It's because um, the uh, blocking of the serotonin receptors um, in the brain could cause um, psychiatric or, uh, or confusion, psychiatric problems or confusion. So you have to be very careful about this. But, this, but it might be possible in theory, oops, geez, to um, use in, uh, instead of a baclofen pump, where we're giving baclofen into the fluid around the spinal cord, to put other chemicals besides baclofen into that, that would maybe not get to the brain, but would only treat the spinal cord. So we need to, we need to understand more about the neurochemistry of spasticity to take it and, and to take advantage of new drug delivery systems like pumps that would target the drugs only to the spinal cord because there are a number of agents that we could use that are available that to treat spasticity. Now, what about weakness? Okay, this is important because if we may, and this is very important point because let's say someone has spasticity and you make it go away. You say, congratulations, there's no spasticity. Well, you haven't done anything for the weakness. Taking the spasticity away, the weakness is a separate thing. I mean, they're related, but, uh, and sometimes you need a, anyway, so you need some spasticity. You can't take it all away. If, otherwise the legs will just collapse. So we need to be able to treat, we, we are emerging and we have opportunities to go further in our um, uh, treatment of spasticity. Treating the weakness is very difficult. Right now, the only thing that is available to treat weakness is exercise. And that's slow, frustrating, incomplete. Um, so, but weakness is a separate property. We talked before at that one slide about the signs of upper motor neuron, we said spasticity, balance, weakness, precision, Um, but so weakness is a, is a separate property that we need to be able to treat. And right now we're not very, we're not effective at all in treating weakness, but that's not the only, um, that's not the only property, but let's just talk, talk about that. Now, this is another general concept. We use the word spastic gait. And I, uh, for one, I think we need to change our language. Uh, and the reason is, is that spastic gait, it's part of the word, spastic paraplegia. It's common to people with HSP and PLS, but spastic gait is not the same as spasticity. And I've said this before, and I know I'm repeating myself, that's okay. Maybe it's not okay. But spastic gait is not the same as spasticity. Spasticity is muscle tightness. But spastic gait is more accurately termed upper motor neuron impairment gait pattern. That it's a particular style of walking that people that have upper motor neuron impairment exhibit. And spasticity is only one feature, one feature of upper motor neuron gait impairment. So what are the other parts of upper motor neuron gait impairment? We call upper motor neuron gait impairment spastic gait, but we really 
have in doing this, in calling it spastic gait, we under understate the importance of these other elements in the walking. What are these other elements? Weakness. Spasticity. Well, we talked about spasticity. Spasticity is a particular type of tightness. Slowness. By slowness, I don't mean how fast a person goes from a, point A to point B. I mean, in the gait cycle, when, what, at what microsecond do their toes come up? Does it come up exactly when it should? Or are the, is the, the toes coming up, we, by that I mean the foot dorsiflexion, is it delayed by a half a second or a tenth of a second? That's what I mean by slowness. I don't mean, I don't mean overall slowness getting out of a chair. I mean, um, uh, for example, uh, activating certain muscles in a stride pattern. Foot dorsiflexion, hip flexion, leg extension, they all have to be exactly timed, like an orchestra director points to the triangle player and says, now. Well, in your walking pattern, you want your toes to come up now, right at that exact moment. If they come up a half a second later, it's too late. You're tripping over your toes. So there's, but that's the kind of slowness I mean. It's, it appears to be delayed motor activation. That's just what it appears to be. I'm not sure about this. Okay, weakness, spasticity, slowness, reduced precision. Re precision is you're trying to step over a curb and you lift your, or you're uh, trying to avoid a puddle and you lift your foot and you put it down, but it's not exactly where you want it to go because we have reduced precision. And very important is balance. Balance is the ability, is, it's both because of the reduced ability to make quick and precise movements. So people have difficulty making these very small adjustments to, to their, you know, you're, imagine you're sitting on a balance ball, one of these, uh, these exercise balls, and you're moving one side, you're moving the other side, forward and back. You've got to make very quick movements. You can't be late in the movement, you'll fall over. But yet the movement itself to correct has to be very subtle. It can't be a big course correction to be thrown to the other side. So the movements for balance have to be very quick and very precise. And that is the problem. We have weakness, we have slowness. And they contribute to balance problem, but also, as I mentioned at the beginning, that we have this uh, very often impaired position sense. I showed you the slide with the blue fibers coming up. That is the uh, proprioception. That's often a a position sense is often affected, particularly in HSP, sometimes in PLS, and that makes balance a problem. Okay, now, and just for the record, um, we're talking about legs, 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 but these motor impairments, the same ones, weakness, slowness, precision, spasticity, balance, they're in the upper extremities in PLS and in some people with, with various forms of, of uh, HSP. Oops. And medicines like baclofen or oral or by the pump, tizanidine, dantrium, Botox, dorsal rhizotomy, these approaches. And yes, I included dorsal rhizotomy because we have a question about dorsal rhizotomy. But dorsal rhizotomy, um, the, all these approaches, they only treat spasticity. They don't address weakness, slowness, precision, or balance. Okay. Now, uh, I'm going to skip ahead of some of this because I want to finish on time. But there are many different approaches to developing therapies. And one important approach, we talk about, you know, learn what we call the rational development based on mechanisms. That's when you find the molecular process and you drill down and identify therapeutic targets and you find genes that can change that or chemicals that can change that, that's what we call rational therapies. But there's other therapies too. And um, an important source of therapy is what we call empiric trials of repurposing treatments. So, dalfampridine showed some benefit in multiple sclerosis, not much, but in some people it was significant. I mean, by not much I mean, a small percent of individuals responded, 
But in some of those people, it was a significant benefit. And it's been tried in people with HSP and PLS and similar results occurred. That is the majority of people taking Ampira or Dalfampridine in HSP and PLS have had no benefit. However, occasionally there are people who do benefit. It's a real benefit and it can be significant. So that, that's important to show that um, one size, one treatment does not help everybody. And okay, that's an example of a treatment that was identified in multiple sclerosis that's now been tried in HSP and PLS, but there are others. What about Rilutec? Well, we try Rilutec in primary lateral sclerosis. Rilutec was identified as, as uh, uh, showing very, very mild, but, st significant, but statistically significant benefit in ALS. And we do use, I do prescribe Rilutec to people with primary lateral sclerosis, but I haven't been prescribing it to people with, with HSP. I'm not sure why but we haven't been. Um, there are other medicines. This new, newer one, this uh, Enderavone, or also called Radicava, is recently, it's an antioxidant, also has shown some benefit for ALS. And that is now on the horizon for trials in PLS and HSP. And there are other agents as well to consider. But my point is, is that we need to mine or repurpose drugs that have shown benefit in any other degenerative neurologic process we want to try in PLS and HSP. And the other thing is that, uh, that we always want to keep in mind what we call serendipitous discovery. And that is, um, uh, for example, tricyclic antidepressants that have changed the, the uh, treatment of bipolar disease, they weren't discovered because we understood the chemistry of depression. They were discovered because people taking certain drugs for tuberculosis in uh, state hospitals with uh, psych state psychiatric hospitals, the patients taking those drugs for tuberculosis had improvement in their mood. So we need to be very attentive if people say I'm taking a drug and my symptoms are worse, or I'm taking a drug and my symptoms are better. We need to have some kind of reporting mechanism that we can start to pay attention to this. Okay, now let's talk about gene therapy. Uh, we talked about the, you know, we can replace the gene if, the, if it's a loss of function. That's fine. But I also want to mention in that same category that we might want to replace another gene. In other words, we can replace the specific gene who's, that's mutated, but we might want to give another gene that seems to be, for example, promoting nerve growth, um, so on. We want to silence the ones that are toxic, but we might also want to silence other genes that are causing neurodegeneration. And I point this out because right now, I mean, there are many, a lot of research for gene therapy in ALS, which we're following carefully, and that one of the approaches is both a gene silencing of a gene that's toxic, as well as overexpression of a growth promoting gene, of, of, a, of a gene that promotes nerve growth. And that seems to this combination of silencing one toxic gene and overexpressing a nerve growth promoting gene, that seems to be uh, a good approach in an animal model of, a, of ALS. I don't wanna, I don't wanna uh, um, leave without saying that other approaches besides stem cells and biochemical approaches, but neurophysiologic approaches such as spinal cord and brainstem stimulation are being explored to treat spasticity. Okay, now, gene therapy is not, a, uh, it's not a science fiction anymore. You know, there are humans uh, with years now uh, uh, with uh, trials of gene therapy in Duchenne musk. This is just a few. This is not the exhaustive list of gene therapy trials for neurologic disease in humans. But it includes Duchenne muscular dystrophy uh, it includes spinal muscular atrophy, and Corey talked about that. Dr. Brosted talked about that last night. It uh, also includes a, a several inherited retinal diseases, and, uh, and it also includes Parkinson's disease. There are, are uh, uh, phase one, two trials of gene therapy in Parkinson's that give, uh, we don't know the genes that cause Parkinson's, but these are genes that um, 
promote uh, dopamine synthesis and promote uh, nerve growth, uh, um, nerve growth and nerve maintenance. So, um, so here is an example. Also, I want to point out this is stereotactic targeted. That means that the gene therapy is injected specifically into the part of the brain where the problem is. So it, it, we have gene therapies, and, and here's an example then in which the gene is not known, but a number of genes for, that will sustain and keep these neurons alive are injected into the part of the brain that is showing degeneration. And that sounds, has several parallels for um, primary lateral sclerosis. If we don't know the genes, that doesn't mean we can't do some kind of gene therapy. It means that we're not gonna give the correcting gene if we don't know what the underlying gene is, but there's other approaches, other genes that can be tried. Anyway, um, so gene therapy is in early stages in laboratory development for a number of types of HSP. I don't wanna mention them all because some are confidential, but SPG4, the one we talked about, Dr. Brostad mentioned, um, in particular uh, for the gene silencing approach, SPG15, and then a group of conditions that are the SPG47 through 52 and others. Okay, lastly, here's the to-do list. And you don't have to take notes because I've got it here. And this is, this is a to-do list that's evolving. The ones I put in red are things that I think we need extra resources on. They're not more important, but we need extra resources, extra attention. So uh, like Frank was mentioning, we need autopsies. I was contacted by an investigator um, this week who's responding to an NIH grant review and said, I need SPG4 postmortem samples in order to address reviewer concern for an NIH grant. This is not a theory. This is what the, what the research needs. So we need, this is, that we need to have, it's, we can get the samples, but we really need to have a sustainable tissue bank, brain spinal cord samples. These are expensive. Okay, now I put stars by some of these because I'm working on them here in Michigan. That doesn't mean they're more important. It's just some things I'm working on. Um, but that is, um, we wanna do, um, we wanna find biomarkers. What are biomarkers? Well, biomarkers are a chemical or a MRI scan or a clinical phenomena, something that correlates with the disease and when the condition is um, uh, advancing, the biomarker number goes up. So we can quantify the change. Um, and the closer the biomarker is to the underlying disease process, the better, but it doesn't have to be. So we need to have really good biomarkers that correlate with disease progression. Why? First of all, it gives us insight into the underlying causes of the condition. But second, if we want to apply therapy, we need to be able to measure if therapy is doing anything. And, a, and we would hope to be able to measure, obviously, if it made a person walk so substantially better in, in a short period of time, well, the biomarker might not be as essential, a molecular biomarker. But with that, for longer term studies, we need to have biomarkers that we can measure um, both for the insight they provide into the cause of the condition and for the uh, ability to track the progress, especially with therapy. Um, now, the other part is that uh, one of the things that we're working on here in Michigan, um, and that is clinical outcome parameters. That is, we, uh, we've, I've been doing this for a number of years and and not very successfully actually, but uh, that is trying to measure the rate of change in people with PLS and HSP. And it, it's very difficult because, um, let's say we measure someone's ability to walk 25 feet. Every year they come in, we do a 25 foot walking test and we, we time them and it's sustained. Every year they walk about the same, we do it over three years, no change. You say, well, their walking is the same, but actually it might not be the same because year after year, they may be swinging their hips differently or thrusting their shoulders back or 
or whatever. They may, their walking may evolve into a differently abnormal pattern, but yet their ability to go 25 feet is still the same time. So um, we, say that we say, they say, well, I think I'm getting worse. And we say, well, you know, all these numbers are the same, but we're just not measuring the right thing. So one of the things we're moving on, moving ahead with is the use of wearable technology. Wearable technology is not simply counting the number of steps you take each day. It talks about, for example, the momentum that you turn with when you're making a turn. It talks about the rate at which your hips come up, I'm sorry, your knees come up when you, do, when you uh, uh, lift your knees or how fast your feet dorsiflex, your toes come up, it's very sophisticated. And uh, uh, so there, we're moving ahead with wearable technology that we could distribute to the field. We could pass out to 100 people. We could say every month, or let's say every six months, wear this for three days, mail it back. And we, could, we could collect data on hundreds of people over years. And that information would, every person would serve as their own comparator. We would say, well, we know that your pattern has been stable or not stable on this kind of data collection uh, system. And now we're gonna try a therapy for you and compare how you are with, the, with your previous track record. Okay, fine. And the other part is, I know I'm a few minutes over, but uh, if you were to ask me today, it's ironic because I, I reviewed this slide and I said the same thing several years ago. If you ask me today, which type of HSP is the best for gene therapy? Well, this is a, a, a I don't know, you know, just, and, but I would pick the type that's most amenable to study. I don't care how rare it is. If there's five people, 10 people, it doesn't matter to me. Rarity doesn't matter because we're a big enough organization in the United States and with, uh, with the liaison with the other countries and there's representatives um, from Spain, a a AEPF um, is with us today or last night at any rate. Um, and and uh, France and Australia, we're connected. SPF is connected with sister organizations in Canada, in Europe, Australia, uh, so forth, Germany. It doesn't matter how rare, we would be able to identify enough people to participate. What's important is that there are known biomarkers, something we can track with the condition. We give a therapy, we can see if it's doing anything. Then we, oops, sorry, keep doing that. We have to have animal models, plural. We need not just mice, rats, larger animals. The larger, the better. Um, large vertebrate animals, um, primates, pig. We need big animals, larger animals, the big, the, uh, diverse, valid animal models. And we need candidate therapy. So any type of HSP that fulfills this category, however rare, is the most amenable to study. And then, and so the ones that are on the short list would be adrenal myelineuropathy, AMN. It's got a good biomarker. It's got candidate FDA approved therapies. It's got animal models, including a primate um, and so on and so forth. Um, and then SPG5, not as common as SPG4, but it's got biomarkers. Why do I take this approach? Because I think if we, we could leverage the success of pilot studies, we need to have success. Once we get success somehow in one of these types of HSP or PLS, then we can use that as a basis for other types of HSP, but we wanna have score success first. Okay, finally, to stay ahead of the curve in developing these therapies in all this research, we have to be the curve. We as an organization, as investigators, as clinicians, as family members, we have to define the advanced edge that we're trying to achieve. Thank you very much. Dr. Fink. Yes. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'm sure I echo. We're um, a little bit late. That's hey, and if you would like to take a few more minutes and cover some more, 
Uh, we're fine. People can jump on, jump off, whatever they need to do. Uh, so, you know, we'll be, we'll be glad to um, allow you a few more minutes if you would like to uh, say anything else. I'm ready. I'm good. Well, we appreciate you, sir, very much. Uh, okay. I think I, I, think See, I, I would have been on time. I would have been on time. But normally, Tim stands in the back of the room and gives me the three-minute warning. So it's a, it, 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 uh, it, it takes a village. It does take a village. And we're so proud and thankful, uh, absolutely honored that you're a part of our village. And thank you very much for all of that information. It is absolutely astounding. And it is essential from what I'm hearing that we have got to become more connected in our organization with all of the folks that have HSP and PLS. Yeah, yes. You know, and that's been a part of our outreach efforts is to try to get folks to understand that it's not just about them donating to the organization, uh, but it is about them trying to get connected to the organization. So if you find out that there are, you know, there's the need for, you know, us to have information for uh, all of the folks that have whatever, you know, SPG number, then we've got that database of individuals. I think Frank has echoed it, Greg's echoed it, I think we've all echoed it. And if there is one thing that is a takeaway from here is that people need to be getting connected to our organization so that we could really reach out to those folks when you need a, a particular uh, gene from, from folks. Is that, is that, would you echo that? Absolutely. Well, very good. Uh, we're going to come back another day, as we have discussed previously, and we are going to, um, we've got tons of questions that folks have sent in. Uh, they're chatting them over on the side. They're chatting them in the chat uh, question and answer box. We are collecting all of that information, as we have said previously, and we would certainly uh, welcome any additional questions after this particular uh, show has stopped airing. Uh, we will, let I me mean, let me kind of touch a few things. We will have this information available on our YouTube channel and on our website, and there will be links from our website that will lead you to the YouTube channel. But for those of you that are YouTubers, then we really want you to subscribe to our channel so that we can, um, you know, absolutely have an opportunity to um, uh, show you where that information is, and then all of this, all these zooms. Uh, will be uploaded to there, and all of our previous past uh, conferences are already on there. So you can listen to all of that at your leisure. You can take notes. You can ask questions. Uh, what we would like to do in the future is to be able to have all of these questions answered by a number of these doctors. Uh, and as you guys might be seeing right now popping up on your screen is a uh, what this platform, Zoom, calls a survey. We certainly want you guys to take a few minutes while you're here with me, and we want you to answer these questions. And of course, we want you to be constructive, but we want you to be kind, because we are um, not professionals in this organization. We are all volunteers. We do not actually pay anyone to help us to do any of these things. So we're all learning here what we can do. Uh, we all have basically, uh, in some cases, some day jobs. So um, we will, let me go back to tell you that we will be putting all of this information on our um, uh, website platforms name them. We have them all. We have LinkedIn, we have Twitter, we have a Pinterest page, we have um, all social media. We have four or five, three or four or five different uh, Facebook pages. And let me say a minute about that. There are tons of Facebook pages out there uh, that have some recognition to HSP, uh, PLS, but there are only a number of those that are specifically sanctioned by the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation. So we want to make sure that you can join all those that you want to, but make sure that you're at least a part of our uh, foundational pages so that you're getting the accurate, current, and up-to-date information. So please let me invite you to join those. If you have questions about those, then you can feel free to email us at the spasticconference at gmail.com, and we will get back with you. I want to make sure that you have joined our organization. There's a place on the website that lets you to do that. It will lead you to our spastic newsletter. 
uh, that uh, comes out, um, the Synapse newsletter, and it can be downloaded. All of that from years past is all on the website. And then also access to our uh, electronic newsletter that comes out monthly as well. So we want to make sure that your information is on there. So I'm giving you guys time that you can uh, look at your polling. We want to give you time to, you know, be able to answer all of those things. I also want you to understand that when we do these Zoom conferences in the future, we're not restricting people to come into the meeting. Now, we're restricting you from having a voice and having a video presence at this time. Now, we hopefully are planning uh, to, then it kind of depends on how you guys rank us in this polling, okay? But we're also looking at perhaps maybe picking folks out of our audience that has sent questions and giving you a chance to have a one-on-one -on -one with these particular doctors for the question that you're answering. I mean, how many of you guys can actually drive to any of these places that these doctors, you know, are in? So we want to make sure that we are uh, having an opportunity to let you visit with these doctors, uh, you know, here on screen with us. And we, we will all learn. We will all hear. So I think this is a very wonderful opportunity that these doctors are giving us uh, so that we can, you know, visit with them and hear and see all this new cutting, you know, cutting edge information. So when you get an email confirmation that says you've registered for Zoom for our conferences, we're going to try to put in that language on that email, kind of what an agenda might be. But you know, we're all kind of flying from the seat of our pants, right? So technology is not always exactly as we hope it to be. So what we want to make sure is, is that you guys understand we're giving you all the current information that we can give you at the time we know it. So just kind of keep that in mind, read thoroughly through the instructions that are on those Zoom. I think most people now kind of know how to do that, but I've gotten several emails from folks that have been pretty upset that we've restricted them from joining. And it's not on our end of the machine, it's, you know, it's whatever happening somewhere else. So I just wanted to make sure that you guys understand that. I want to take a moment to make a big shout out to my teammate, Hank from Chicago, and I've asked him to kind of jump on real quick so that we can see him. And that way everybody understands that it's just not me sitting here putting all this information together. But we have a team of folks that has been working with us. And I uh, would wanted you guys to just take a moment to sit, hear a, a moment from, from Hank. Hi, Hank. Thank you so much. I can't say enough about all the work and effort that you have helped me in putting this together and all of our team that has been a part of the presentation tonight, today, and last night. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Let me also say, uh, you guys, the polling is still up. The survey is still going. And once I kind of shut us down here, we will be uh, saying, Sorry about that. Uh, again, technical problems cause us to kind of come and go. Uh, it's not something that we try to do on purpose to, to make us look bad in any way. But I wanted to thank Hank per, uh, publicly for all the work that he's done with us. I also want to remind you guys that we're going to be looking at putting some more of these, these Zoom conferences together uh, between now, here in the, maybe the next couple of weeks. So you guys be watching out on social media for us. Uh, and then the email blast that we'll send out uh, under the network for good platform and our spastic world newsletter but what we'll also be doing is that come uh, uh, August the 23rd through the 29th that is our awareness week that we are going to be doing all kinds of like what we will call challenges so that people have an opportunity on social media to post something and use the hashtag HSP AND PLS so that's we're one foundation for both of these motor neuron diseases. So we are all reaching out to share, as you see here, HSP and PLS, add the hashtag in front of it. And if you just go to Google and type that in, you'll basically see all of our social media platforms. 
So when you're talking to somebody and you're trying to get them to understand what it is, say this, say, just go to Google and do this. We even have this on our bracelets for those of you. And then I wanted to tell you that the Awareness Week, we will allow there to be at least 30 minutes that we're all going to come together on all these little thumbnails and see each other so that uh, you can have a few minutes just to shout out what you guys are doing on those days. There's Each day has a challenge. So we want to make sure that, and it's not hard challenges. It's like getting your wacky sunglasses. It's putting on your, you know, your wacky socks or your, you know, your sports memorabilia t-shirts. Then, now I'm talking about t-shirts. So I wanted to remind you that we have our own store and we have a, a company that will work with us on shipping those out whenever you want to order something. So if you have problems sh getting your shipment or you have problems ordering product, please don't badmouth us all over social media. Just send me an email and I will work with you directly with that company and we'll see what we can do to get those problems straightened out. You know how everything is when you're trying to do something first time and it being new. So I think with that being said, I don't think there's anything else that um, I need to share with you at this time, except for, my gosh, wasn't that wonderful to hear all of this new, exciting, hopeful information that's happening around us uh, when we don't necessarily think anything's going on and that nobody's listening to us or nobody cares about us. We've got a whole whole lot more information to share with you. We've had a ton of doctors that's on watching us. We've had over um, 244 people have registered for the conference. And today there was like 145 people that was all on board with us listening and watching. And what we wanna do is to be able to allow all those other doctors to have their time with us on a Zoom. So I look forward to talking with you guys again. And again, if you have any questions, please reach out to me and we'll make sure that the right person answers you and gets you all the information that you need. So with that being said, I'd like to say good afternoon. Have a great Saturday. Stay safe, be healthy, and reach out to us and join our foundation and all the work that we're doing. Thank you so much. Y'all take care.